through our lives and uh, they're just acquaintances but these people have been special and I'm a better person for knowing you guys <laughs> so, so anyway start off as Joel Olstein says with a couple funnies so this uh, this young preacher just moved into this town and he'd only been there about three weeks now if just to get ahead a little bit, this was before the time of cell phones or anything. So the local funeral director called him and he said, hey, I have a man that died and he has no family. And I just wondered if you could come and say a few words over his grave. So he agreed, got directions. Well, anyway, the day he was to be buried, it was way out in the country. And this guy got lost, this new pastor. So he stopped and he asked his other guy for directions and he told him and so he pulls in and these two guys are along the edge of the road and they're uh, sitting under a tree with their shovels and this supposed grave is already, he was 30 minutes late so it was already covered up. So he got out and he went up and he he preached a little message for about 15 minutes and he blessed, blessed this guy. And uh, he looked over and he said, have a night, these guys were eating lunch, have a nice day, fellas, and he left. And then one guy looked at the other guy and he said, you know, I've been putting septic tanks in for 30 years and this is the first time I ever seen one prayed over and blessed. <laughs> and then this, uh, this guy lived with his mother so she comes in on a Sunday morning, it's getting late, and she says, hey, it's time to get up and go to church. And he said, I don't want to go. Well, what's your reasons for not wanting to go? And he said, well, I got two reasons. Number one, I don't like those people. Number two, they don't like me. And she said, well, I'll give you two reasons. One reason, you're 54 years old, and the second reason, you're the pastor. <laughs> And then I, I saw a, a cartoon on Facebook the other day and this really describes my wife because she tells me how to drive all the time. But anyway, uh, it showed this couple sitting at a stoplight and it, the caption read, this is a new safety device for driving. He has his seat belt on, down the belt down across here. Her seat belt is across her mouth. <laughs> So anyway, it's just a joke, honey. So anyway, uh, we're gonna we're gonna look here this morning, and actually, uh, a couple different little messages here tied into one. And if you can remember back when. Uh, Saul was chasing David. He, uh, David went to the priest of Nob, and they, they gave, they actually gave him the the sacred bread and Goliath's sword, and they took care of him. So then Saul, in retribution, he he murdered the priest. And uh, anyway, uh, later the the uh, the people of that town. They, they put to death Saul's 70, 70 sons, and uh, they, they beheaded all of them. But anyway, when Saul and Jonathan were killed, uh, it says here, uh, uh, Abner, of course, he was Saul's main guy, he put Ishabeth, son of Saul, in as king. And uh, anyway, when uh, they heard, when he, Ishabeth heard that Abner had died in Hebron, he, he lost courage and, and all Israel became alarmed. Now Saul's son had two men who were leaders. I'm in uh, actually 2 Samuel chapter 4 here. It says uh, one named Banana and Rechab. And they were sons of uh, Remian, the Barahite, from the tribe of Benjamin. But anyway, uh, 
these two guys went and uh, they went to Ishbabeth's house and they went in and they murdered him in his own bed. And they cut his head off and it says here, uh, they, they, they came to David and they said, here is the head of Ishabeth, son of Saul, your enemy, who tried to kill you. This day the Lord has avenged my Lord, the king, against Saul and his offspring. And David answered, Recap, and his brother Bena, the sons of Remian, the Barahite, as surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me from every trouble, when someone told me Saul is dead, and they thought he was bringing good news, I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. This was reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house, and uh, in his own bed, should I demand the blood from your hand to rid the earth of you? So David gave the order to his men, and they killed them. They cut off their hands and their feet, and they hung their bodies in the pool of Hebron. But they took the head of Ishabeth and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. Now, when, <clears throat> when they found out this Ishabeth became alarmed, uh, Jonathan had a son. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. And when he was five years old and they heard the news about Saul and Jonathan uh, that came from Jezreel, the nurse picked, picked up this Messiah and uh, she fled and she dropped him and he became crippled in both feet. But anyway, now we're going to go back to... Uh, Oh, wait a minute here. Going the wrong way. We're going to go into 2 Samuel chapter 9 here now. Now, when David finally took over as king, David asked, Is there anyone still left in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness? Now, there was a servant in Saul's house named Ziba. Now, I'm in 2 Samuel chapter 9 here. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba at your service? He replied. The king asked, Is there one still alive in the house of Saul whom I can show kindness? Ziba, Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, he is in the house of Makar, son of Amiel, and Lodabar. Now, <clears throat> Saul or David and Jonathan were very close. They were best friends. And it said their love was even that greater than a woman to a man. They were, they were so close. And even though Jonathan was actually in line to be king, he knew God wanted David to be king. And he actually protected him from his father Saul, tried to kill him many, many times. So they made a pact that they would always be there for each other. So when David finds out that this young man, Messiah F, is in Lodabar, and, uh, and just remember one thing, this Messiah Feth, was actually in line to be, he could actually claim to be king because he was the only survivor out of Saul's family and Saul was king. So by uh, heritage, it came down, you know, he, he could actually claim the kingship. But anyway, uh, so it says, that, so the king David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Makar, son of Amiel. When Messiah, Theth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Messiah, Theth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore you to the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Messiah, Theth, bowed down and said, What? 
is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that the master's grandson may be provided for. And Messiah Theft's grandson of your master will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever the Lord king commands his servant to do. So Messiah Theft at day... So Messiah ate at David's table like one of the king's son. Messiah had a young man named son named Micah, and the members of Ziba's household were servants to Messiah. And Messiah lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Now, where was your load to bar? Load to bar is a place of discouragement, of utter, Bob played that song last week, when he reached way down. Yeah. That, that was always my dad's favorite song because he said, God really reached down for me. And he did for each of us. But Lodabar, you know, this man was in utter, he was probably in poverty. He was probably on shave and dirty. And... David says to this Ziba, you go get this young man. And he brought him in and he restored him as he did each of us. We all had our load to bar where we was down. We were, we were low. We, were, we thought we were useless. He says, what, what, what do you want of a dead dog like me? How many times have we asked God, God, what, what, why do you even want anything to do with me? You know? Uh, but he restored him. He restored his, his grandfather's property to him. He, he set him up with income. And, uh, you know, I know, you know, I ran for, from God for a lot of years. And I, I was almost killed twice in six months. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I went through about three careers. I... My f family was always in the timber business, and I, when I got out of high school, I worked for my dad for a couple years, and uh, I went from there to the strip mines, and uh, I actually became pretty good on all kind of different equipment. I ended up running a big front-end loader, uh, 13 and a half yard bucket on it, loading rock trucks. I loaded coal. I actually ran for uh, the company I was working for got a prototype loader in from Laterno. It was a 22-yard uh, bucket on it, and it had, uh, it, the loader was 53 feet long from counterweight to the tip of the bucket, and you could pull, I have a picture somewhere at home, they pulled a mechanics truck inside of the bucket, and uh, I ran that for about a year, and then they, they didn't keep it, and I had offers to go three different places in the country to people wanted to buy one had people from all over the country come in and ride with me and stuff and uh but uh we carried dirt with it it was uh the company i worked for it had 85 ton rock trucks and it was too big uh it was too big to load them and uh but anyway it was a good experience for me and then i went from there uh, the coal business, the company I was working for, it got bad. They actually cut our wages. And uh, I went in, I, I worked for them for seven years, and the guy that was running it, they put him out. And the walkers from out here in Woodland, they, they were 51% owners of the company. And the first thing they did when they took over, they cut our wages. Uh, they, they cut my hourly wage a buck and a half an hour. So... I decided to go in business for myself. Me and my buddy, we cut timber, and uh, we uh, we had a job back in here behind the explosive place down here, and uh, I came out with a load of logs. We had a, uh, we had bought a skidder, a timber jack skidder. We had a 
log loader, and one 10 Prentice log loader mounted on a power unit we towed around and uh, we had a F600 Ford truck. It was a single axle, but we could haul on posted roads because we was under the 10 ton weight limit. So it worked out pretty good for us. We'd haul about a thousand feet of logs. So I came down with a load of logs and they were just putting the truck run off in. I got right there and I went to hit my brakes and they went clear to the floor. So I had no brakes coming off of that mountain and this intersection wasn't like it was is now. It used to go around, there was an island in the middle, road turned to the right. I came around there, I don't know how fast I was going, but I had no brakes. I hit the island and it flipped me. Uh, I, I don't know how many times I flipped. And all I had chance to get out of my mouth was, oh God. And I remember ending up with my belly on the floor of the cab and I, it was starting to burn. And I crawled out the window, and after I looked at it later, it was, I don't, I don't, to this day, there, there must have been an angel there holding that cab up. And the only thing I got out of it is I got hit in the back of the head with the fire extinguisher and had six stitches, and it even singed the back of my hair. And I was walking away from the Lord at the time. And after I went to the emergency room, they checked me all out, I got home. I didn't even have my shirt on. They cut my shirt off. And we had just, we had just paid everything off that we owned. And we were going to go bigger and better. We was going to get uh, a, a, a credit line from a bank and go bigger. And God said to me, you know, I've been waiting for you for a long time. And he said, I'm not going to give you any more chances. So that was my load to bar lost everything just and uh, I came to church up here at Sunday and I didn't I, God was speaking to me but anyway I went home and it was on a Saturday night and I was I was laying in bed and I was watching John Jacobs and the power team the weightlifters and uh, John Jacobs was on there and he gave a invitation and I accepted God right there in my bed but that Sunday I came in here right over there and at the time my 12 year old son was with me and we both knelt and I accepted the Lord and so did he. But little did I know six years later he was going to be taken from us. But anyway, that was my Lodabar. And we all have, have been to Lodabar. And uh, as this Messiah theft was. But you know what now? I eat at the king's table. <laughs> Every day, I eat my breakfast, I have my prayer, and I have fellowship with God. And uh, the latter half of my life has been a lot better than the, the former. And, uh, you know, uh, I've been through some stuff, but, you know, when, uh, when, we have, when we have God, we definitely go through it. We don't stay there. But... Uh, you know, I was coming to church this morning and uh, David Jeremiah was on there and he said, do not forsake ourselves assembling together in Hebrews. And uh, think about something. When you don't come to church, you don't come to Bible study, who are you forsaking? Yourself. You're not forsaking God, you're forsaking yourself. We had a guy who used to come here, Brother Kramer, and he always said, a W-E-E-K makes a W-E-A-K. So when we, we need together, remember there's power in prayer, but there's power in numbers. And, you know, God called us sheep of his pasture. He called us sheep. He wasn't, he wasn't giving us a compliment. You know, sheep are dumber. They're the dumbest animal there is. If one goes over a cliff, the, the other 99 will go with them. So he, he knew we needed a shepherd. So, you know, and when he said in that scripture, when one sheep's out there and it's lost, he, the, the shepherd went and got it because he knew that it was in peril. So that's the way God is with us. But I, I want to I read you something here. The passion principle. Passion. Pr now, when we have a passion for something, I have a passion for hunting. I have a passion for fishing. 
I, I have a passion for bagels. I, I have three bagels. I love to hunt rabbits. I take them out and I just got one and I finally got her trained, but it's a big accomplishment. But anyway, her name's Ruby Diamond. <laughs> she has a little diamond on the back and she's bad. But anyway, she likes to chase rabbits though. But anyway, it says about passion. We have passion for something. We we do it you know if we want to we want to have a passion for something you know uh they had that movie passion for christ you know but uh it says passion pursues passion is david loving god with a fixed intensity as he vows to seek him with his whole heart o o obey the word and his whole heart and pray with his whole heart passion pledges passion is david praising god for his whole heart before all god's other gods uh, passion confronts passion is elijah standing up to the prophets of bell and calling down the fire of god passion produces passion is nehemiah completing the wall of jerusalem in a record of 52 days in the face of opposition remember them guys worked they had a sword on their side and a tool in their hand because they was afraid they were going to be attacked and uh passion persists passion is jeremiah refusing to retire from ministry in spite of discouragement because of the fire in his bones would not let him quit Passion prays. Passion is Daniel praying in spite of the threats against his life because of the prayer was heartfelt in his life. Remember they threw Daniel in the lines then for praying. Passion moves. Passion is Peter judging out, jumping out of the boat to walk with Jesus on the water in spite of impossibility of it. Passion motivates. Passion is Paul turning the zeal of his past into the fire for the cause of Christ. You know, Paul was zealous to persecute the Christians, but when God got a hold of him and blinded him and, and, and changed him, he, he, didn't, he didn't change the passion. He just, well, he, he still had passion, but he changed the passion. He changed the passion from murdering Christians to saving the Gentiles. So, you know, passion is... is uh, is important in our life and uh anyway we're gonna we're gonna look at something else being it's pastor's appreciation sunday i always i always bring this up and it's it's a good thing to bring up on pastor's appreciation sunday because we need to stand behind our pastor and his wife and i'm gonna put a little different twist on it here today though it says and i'm in uh Exodus chapter 17 it says and I'm going to start with verse uh, 8 or yeah it says uh, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim Moses said to Joshua choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands so here's the problem they had just come out of Egypt and they really didn't have a lot of people trained for battle. So he's, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men, go pick some of the best men, go out and fight these Amalekites. Now, these Amalekites, they were going to attack Israel. They didn't do anything. They went around them. They tried to avoid... Now, it says history repeats itself. What's happening right now over there? We got Hamas, we got Hezbollah, we got the Houthis, and we got Iran. Unprovoked, last October 7th, they came in and they murdered uh, 1,200 Jewish people. Murdered them. They had a girl the other day on the 700 Club Bear. She was 26 years old. Her and her boyfriend was at this music thing. They were trying to flee in their car, and it showed these, these Hamas, hundreds of them, with AK-47s peppering these cars. 
they, sh they shot into their car. Their car went careened off the road, flipped over. Her boyfriend, they had just got married. He, they shot him in the head. She reached over and tried to talk to him and his head was, half his head was blown off. So she, she was in utter panic because they were going from car to car seeing who was alive and they were, kill, they were, they were murdering him. So she took some of the blood off her boyfriend and spread it on herself and pretended she was dead. And when they came up to the car, they, they, they walked by her. But unprovoked, just, just history repeats itself. Here we are again. When Abraham and Sarah was waiting for an heir, they ran ahead of God. Uh, Sarah says, take my, take my maidservant, Hagar, and we'll have a family through her. She couldn't, they wanted to run ahead of God. So she was an Arab. Hagar was an Arab. And then out come Ishmael. So it got so bad that they, uh, Sarah told her, she said to Abraham, get rid of her. So she left, but God sent an angel and said, I'm going to make you into a, a nation also, Ishmael. So here, here, 2,000 and some years later, we have half Arab and half Jew. We call them, uh, oh, we call them, uh, what word am I looking for? Uh, not, well, yeah, they were, they were called Samaritans, but Palestinians. Today we have the Palestinians. Hamas, that's Hamas. Yeah, we're sending all this money over there. And, you know, for, for relief, and it's gone right in Hamas's pocket, and they're, they're shooting missiles back at Israel. You know, uh, when President Trump was in there, they used to give them aid. He cut it off, because what they's doing, they's, I seen this the other day on the 700 Club with uh, uh, Gordon Robertson. They take us money that we send them, and these terrorists, when they go do something, when they go uh, explode themselves in front of the Jewish people and kill people, or they murder people, that family, if, they, if that guy is even martyred, they're set up with a pension. Our money. We're, we're funding that. And Trump cut it out, and as soon as Biden got, and I don't get to politics, but as soon as President Biden got back in there, he restored it. But anyway, here, here we go, unprovoked. Doesn't history repeat itself? So it says, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands, held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, put it under him, and sat, he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that the hands remained steady till sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Okay, when we raise these hands to God, that means Moses was saying, God, I, I surrender this thing to you. I surrender, you know. I had a history, world history teacher in school, and he said, the Germans, he, he landed in York and he went through D-Day and the whole thing right through. But he said, when they hated the Germans so bad, he said, when they'd come out and surrender with their hands up, they'd march them off to the side and shoot them. That's what they did to our men, which that probably isn't right. But Moses, they're holding Moses' hands up, and as long as they're up, they're winning. But when we hold our hands up to God, one hand is no doubt, one hand is no fear. That he is the king of kings and the lord of lords and that he's going to, we got we to extend our antennas up, you know, they're lightning rods. We extend them up and uh, anyway, uh, you know, when you hold your hands up, you get tired. You know, just down the boot camp, uh, they used to PT the inmates, and uh, the women guards would have trouble. By the time these guys, they were there six months, by, by the time 
they went through, we had three phases, gold phase, red phase, and then when they got in gold phase, uh, you just, they, they were used to PT so much that they, they would take sometimes two or three guards to smoke one inmate because they were in such good shape, you know. But these female inmates, they, they had trouble uh, disciplining these inmates because, you know, they used PT. So what they did, they'd get these big inmates and they'd do arm circles. One, two, three, one. One, two, three, two. And they weren't very big. And they could do this for an hour at a time. And it would just kill them guys. So, you know, anyway, they were holding Moses' hands up and they, they defeated, you know, it says, the, the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to remain remembered be remembered and make sure that joshua hears it because i will completely blot the name of amlek from under heaven moses built an altar and called the lord is my banner so these are our banners jehovah nisi the lord is our banner terrible as an army with banners when the israelites went out to fight the the musicians and stuff went first and they put so much fear in the enemy that most of them fled before the army even fought. So terrible is an army with banners. Jehovah Nisi, he is our banner. And uh, anyway, he said, because, he said, because my hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. I'm going to tell you this morning, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran will not prevail against Israel. God gave Abraham that ground as the Abrahamic covenant. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave that ground to them, and there will not be a two-state solution. I'm telling you, God's going to destroy Hamas and Hezbollah just like he did the Amalekites. And if the truth be known, they're probably descendants of the Amalekites somewhere down through. But anyway, let's go, let's go back here to, let me till I find it here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Uh, the last verse, 19. It says, when the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies. This is when they went into the promised land. From all your enemies around you in the land he is giving you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So I'm telling you right now, history repeats itself. They will not be victorious over Israel. Israel will prevail in this thing. And uh, they're God's chosen people. And uh, there's... There's no way that they're gonna they're gonna defeat Israel because and uh, and like I said there will not be a two state solution which the Democrats are calling for uh, there will be there will be peace over there you know I've been watching David Jeremiah and he's he's been preaching on the uh, the golden age about the thousand year millennial reign and uh, how God's gonna you know. Right there, God's going to come out of heaven and he's going to destroy the armies of the earth and he's going to set up his millennial reign. And the good news is, as David Jeremiah said, the devil and his high priest are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. In the abyss. The abyss is the hottest place of hell. You know, there's rewards in heaven. There's crowns. But there's also levels of punishment in hell, I believe. And the abyss is the lowest and the hottest, and that's where the devil's going to be bound. And he's the devil and the uh, the uh, high or the uh, the the devil and the uh, antichrist are going to be thrown into that lake of fire, and they're going to they're going to be in there for a thousand years. We're going to have a thousand years here without any devil. And he says, the lion will lay down with the lamb. The little kid will play in the nest of the cobras. And it will be, he's going to roll with an iron scepter. And that's the only time there's going to be peace on earth. You know, they, they said in uh, 
Isaiah there, peace on earth, good will to men. That's what the angel said when Christ was born. Behold, peace on earth, good will to men. And he's going to come back and he's going to set up his thousand year millennial reign here. And you know, the tribulation, there's going to be ecological disasters on this earth like you've never seen. But God said the new Jerusalem's coming down and he's going to restore this earth and he's going to restore its beauty. And we're going to rule and reign with them, you know. And uh, I, I've already named my horse that I'm coming back on, Lightning. And so, you know, it shows, it shows us coming with God. Right there, Elizabeth Lindbergh painted that mural before she died. The armies of heaven are going to come out in the, in the valley of Medigo, Armageddon, and they're going to destroy the armies of the earth. And God's going to set up, he's going to step on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to set up his millennial kingdom. And we're going to rule and reign with them. So that's the good news. If you're, and you know, our pastor, let's let's stand behind him. Let's let's be there to lift them up and encourage them. And uh, you know, nothing nothing can encourage a pastor more than you being here. And you coming up to him. If you really want to give him a heart attack, come up and say, "Hey, pastor, is there anything I can do here?" And he'll. His heart will take a flipper. But anyway, and pray for him each day. I pray for him every day, you know. Like I said, uh, you know, you, you're only as good as the people behind you. And we have good people here. We don't have many. We have a remnant, but we have good people. And uh, let's, let's try to propel this, this, this church forward and... and Get behind this ministry and let's fill up some of these empty seats. Uh, I called a person that was coming, was supposed to be here today, and they didn't show up. But anyway, I called them and invited them. And uh, anyway, they didn't come. But anyway, they were invited. And uh, so let's, uh, like I said, let's 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 tell the good news and uh, let's let's. Uh, I mean, for, for the few people we have here, it's, it, it's really a miracle what we're doing here, you know? I mean, we're getting ready to put more, more heat in here, a, a many splits. And uh, anyway, we're, we're going forward. You know, if you... Uh, it says a rolling stone catches no moss, and a pond without an overflow becomes stagnant. And if we... If we if we're full of living water and we keep it, we become stagnant and stale. We need to let that overflow out. You know, if you have a pond and there's no outflow, there's an inflow and there's no outflow, it'll get stagnant, full of algae. And nothing's, it's not good for anything. So anyway, I want uh, Pastor and uh, Carol to come up here. We're going to gather around them and, and pray. And uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to bless them.